So um, today we're going to talk about um, fractures and dislocations of the proximal interphalangeal joint of the fingers. The interphalangeal joint have uh, an interesting anatomy and we're going to cover that very briefly. And then I want to talk a bit about the mechanism of injury. Uh, we're going to talk about volar fracture dislocations, dorsal fracture dislocations, and then another part on salvage surgery. What you do when, uh, when things have failed. So the proximal and uh, middle phalanx articulate at the PAP joint, and it has a shape that's quite stable intrinsically. So if you uh, have a bone integrity, the joint itself is quite stable. And this is further stabilized by the uh, proper collateral ligament, which is this part here and goes from the side of the proximal phalanx to the volar half or volar third of the middle phalanx. And that will be important where it inserts. And then there is the accessory collateral that goes from the side of the phalanx and from the proper to the volar plate. And the volar plate inserts very strongly at the base of the middle phalanx, particularly on the sides, not so much in middle part, and then proximally has two check reins that insert at the neck and a bit more proximal of the proximal phalanx. So if you look at the, contra the contrast, the construct from where the proximal phalanx is, you have a nice curved joint surface. And here, when you look at it, it's, it seems to continue into the volar plate uh, and makes a very nice uh, place like a seat for the proximal phalanx to sit with an arms of an armchair. So the head of the proximal phalanx is very comfortable there and usually very stable, intrinsically stable. But this is the commonest uh, joint injured in the hand. And this is a spectrum of injury that we're going to cover. And you can divide them in parts, but this is a bit artificial because they sort of merge and they move from one to the other. And we will look at volar plate avulsions, dorsal dislocations and fracture dislocations, palmar dislocations and fracture dislocations, and then the so-called pilon fraction. And if you have a, a finger, you'll have the PIP joint there with the strong volar plate, the collateral ligament proper, and the accessory collateral. And the typical injury that I see the most is probably um, a sport involving a ball where the ball hits the finger when the player is going to catch it and causes a hyperextension injury. And if that goes beyond the elasticity of the volar plate, it's going to pull off, usually with a small fragment of bone because the insertion is very strong. So you get a fracture rather than uh, breaking out the volar plate in most of them. And then as the insult is gone, comes back like that, and the patient will come with a swollen joint, a bit painful, a bit of bruising, and a radiograph that looks like this. So that's a volar plate avulsion. If the force is higher, we'll displace the, that joint even more, and it can cause a full dislocation. And uh, that's obvious because the finger looks deformed and is very painful and is often uh, reduced on side. Players or their physio or somebody else will reduce it for them. Occasionally they'll come to hospital with the finger still dislocated and very painful. And the plan is to reduce this as soon as we can to make it comfortable and then get some new check x-rays to look for any fractures and look at the alignment. If the ball comes more perpendicular, there will be a shearing force and often um, a fragment will stay with the volar plate and the rest of it will go and displace dorsally. Now you can imagine that depending on the size of that fragment, part of the collateral ligament will be with the big fragment that go dorsal or not. So the size of that fragment will be uh, an important factor in determining the stability because then as it comes down, you get that it doesn't reduce completely. It gets a slightly subluxated dorsally. And they come with a radiograph that looks like that. And there are two radiological signs that are important here. One is the little V sign, because these two surfaces should be parallel. 
but as they diverge dorsally, you get this little V uh, there. And if there is a bit of V sign, even if it's subtle, that means that slightly subluxating. So watch for that. And the other sign is that the, along, the axis of the bone should be collinear in extension and they're not. The axis of the middle phalanx is slightly dorsal. The other option is that the ball comes end on or somebody falls against the wall and you stab your finger against the wall and that causes compression of the finger and the bone at the base of the fragment can fracture and you'll often have a wall fragment, a dorsal fragment and a depressed fragment in the middle. And uh, they'll come a little bit like that. And these pilon fractures are slightly different, but part of the same spectrum. Now, completely different thing are rotational injuries to the finger. And the ones I see often is uh, people who horse ride or people who get their fingers caught in a rotating machine. And that causes a rotation to the finger. Normally the finger is flexed because it's holding something and there is a rotational force. And what that does, it rotates the middle and distal phalanxes and that pivots and the head of the proximal phalanx breaks through the extensor mechanism. One of the collateral ligaments is avulsed while the other one, it stays and becomes the pivot for rotation. The extensor mechanism may just split between the central slip and the lateral band, or it may pull the central slip of the bone. And that will also have some consequences for treatment but the patient will come with x-rays and radiographs looking like this to, to the hospital. They usually easy to reduce unless the whole head of the phalanx has gone through the extensor mechanism and gets trapped. And then can, that can be a little bit difficult, but really quite unstable. So the first injury we want to look at is the volaplate avulsion. We looked at the volaplate, inserted strongly at the base of the phalanx connected with the um, accessory collateral and it's got two check reins that insert into the proximal phalanx. So hyperextension will cause an avulsion like that. So you can imagine that the volaplate is there, proper collateral is there and accessory is there. Once this presents, they're usually stable. So things to do is check the collateral ligaments clinically and if they're stable, they can get moving. I think these injuries get over treated, often put in a splint when there is no need. And body strapping usually for about three weeks is sufficient. Now, if the collateral ligament was evolved and they've got instability side to side, uh, you could splint them in extension for two to three weeks and that will allow it to settle. Uh, I don't think there is any need to surgically uh, repair the collateral ligament or reattach the collateral ligament. Even in elite sports people, they, they heal very well. So if we talk about PIP dislocations, fracture dislocation, the first thing is, is it a dorsal or a palmar one? A dorsal is where the distal part goes dorsal, palmar one is goes, goes down or is rotated. It's a rotational injury. And for the palmar one, the questions are, does it reduce in extension and is it a stable? So they'll come with the radiograph uh, a bit like that, if it's, if it's dislocated. And you can imagine that the head of the proximal phalanx has gone between the central slip and the lateral band. And then the injury to the uh, tensor mechanism, as it was pointed out a long time ago by Alberto Yuk, can be a transverse one where there is an avulsion of the central slip or a longitudinal one where the head breaks between the central slip and the lateral band. And I've also seen uh, an injury of this uh, uh, splitting the central slip actually. Uh, and that's significant because um, the repair you do for the extensor mechanism is different. So be very careful with these ones because they're easy to reduce but very unstable. And you, you have to follow them up very closely if you treat them conservatively. So if you treat them conservatively, what kind of a splint do you use? Well, for most of them, a short splint would be the best one. 
and that's because it keeps the PAP joint straight, allows the extensor mechanism and the collateral to heal, but allowing the distal interphalangeal joint to flex has two big advantages. One is that it keeps that joint and the flexor tendon profundus moving. The other one is that as it flexes, it pulls the extensor mechanism towards distal and it closes the gap that is trying to heal on the dorsal part of the PIPJ. So that would be good. So just imagine that the head goes through those, um, that tissue between the central lip and, uh, and the, the lateral band, and that's the bit that needs to heal. If you don't put them in extension, you will get a boot on your deformity. You'll get a fixed flexion contracture of the volar plate and secondarily down the line, uh, a hyperextension of the DIPJ. What if it doesn't reduce or if the bone is, 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 is not going into place? When, what we do is um, dorsal approach, find a bit of bone, reduce it. And then my preference is fix it with a very little plate. And uh, that usually is not difficult. You can put the plate on the bay area. Sometimes you need to split a little bit the lateral bands distally so they don't catch on the plate. And that gives you quite a strong construct. Sometimes the, the bits are very fragmented and uh, this screw there doesn't feel very strong. And then what you can do is put the stitch under the plate and do a tendon repair that's anchored here. And that uh, works quite well, takes the tension of your, your fixation on the, on the small bit. And I like using something like a 4-0 Etibond white. I don't like putting green stitches or blue stitches there because the skin is very thin and the patient can see that there is something blue or green and they don't like it. So just use a white stitch there if you can. And then once you've done that, you can get them moving reasonably soon and they get a good range of movement. What about this one? This is a bit more like, um, like a pillow fracture. But again, I would uh, approach it dorsally, make sure we lift the joint surface. If necessary, put a bit of bone graft or bone substitute because there, there'll be a cavity behind that. And uh, my preference would be fixing with a little plate. And again, if necessary, put the stitch in the extensor tendon and tie it to the plate. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop here uh, for a minute. Uh, if there are any questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll answer them as we go along. And I just wanted to ask uh, Gray and Wolfgang if they have any, any comments or, or any tips about all this and if they agree with the mechanism of injury exposed. Gray, you go first. Um, okay, well, I think you're right about the mechanism of injury. I would also say a lot of these are a fall on the outstretched hand because when you fall on your hand, the bit that hits the ground first is your fingers. And we've just written that up. So Giddens and Giddens in Inju Injury published in the last month or so. So a lot of these are direct impaction falls. Um, with the volar plate injuries, I've suffered it twice. I think buddy strapping is unnecessary and probably just restrictive. So I just get them going. And I think that one in probably something like three or 500 ends up with a bit of hyperextension instability if they have a swan neck tendency, but I don't know how to recognize those, so I can't stop them. For the intermediate case you showed with the fracture off the back, that's a dorsal impaction fracture, not an avulsion injury. So it's a bit like the bony mallet injury. Um, so the extensor mechanism is largely intact and you don't have to worry about it after a few weeks because it heals with bone very quickly. So I've never fixed one of these surgically open. The only time you need to worry, in my opinion, is when the middle phalanx drifts volarly, like the subluxation of the bony mallet injury. And if that happens, and you normally you can stabilize it with a small splint for a few weeks, or you can put a single wire on that. So I think opening it up is much more complex than some people think. And as you said, Carlos, your fixation isn't always great. But if you think of it as a dorsal impaction fracture, it's not going to get a significant boutonniere deformity because most of the extensor mechanism is intact. Okay, Th thanks for that. Wolfgang, any comments from you on all this? 
you're you muted at the moment. What, what, what's going on? You, you, you mute it. You need to t turn the sound on. Uh, yeah, can now, you hear that, me? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can okay. now. So I have a question uh, about um, one type of plate evolution. I, I'll give you the picture. No, no, not that one, that one. You see here a big, big volar fragment and it seems not to fit into the, into the area, yeah? And I think uh, we should point out which of this uh, volar plate evulsion should be operated, yeah? Because you said you can treat all uh, conservatively. And I think this type is, you see here, it's turned around 90 degrees, but it's also turned out of the plane. It comes to lie beneath the flexor tendon, yeah? And if you look, you see it here, really beneath the flexor tendon and turned around 90 degree. And I think this type you should operate because it, it blocks your volar recess and the people can't flex if you let it like it is. Also when it, you fix it uh, for four weeks in, uh, in, in extension. What do you think? Uh, yes, I do. I do agree that there is this one that is probably the exception to the rule, and I'll show you. I'll show you one later on. Okay. Uh, and I'll show you how it went wrong, <laughs> because we treated it like that. So there are exceptions. There are exceptions to that. Uh, we've got a few questions, but what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to carry on, move to the next part quickly, quickly, uh, which is this, and then we'll go back to the questions. Uh, okay, so this is this is the, the the commonest type of these ones. I see someone who's been um, and this guy playing cricket and comes with a painful uh, joint that's been manipulated. They tell me, but it is still slightly deformed. And you can see the two radiological signs: the axis of the middle phalanx is dorsal, and you can see the little v. So that tells you that there is a subluxation there. Uh, so that position will will not do. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do you manage this? I mean, every one of you will have an opinion on this, but mm -hmm. uh, my view on that is that if they reduce inflection, the best way to manage them is with a dorsal blocking splint. So I would take them to our, our little image intensifier. I know that depending on the size of the fragment, and they'll be uh, more stable if the fragment is small because more of the collateral ligament is inserted on the dorsal fragment. And I think it was Hill Hastings who proposed this that uh, less than 30% of the fragment that's going to be stable, more than 50% is going to be unstable and 30 to 50 is going to be, is going to be ten tenuous. So if by uh, flexing the joint uh, up to 30, 40 degrees, uh, reduces the fracture and it's congruent in the rest of flexion, uh, then we just treat it in a, in, in a dorsal blocking splint. If uh, you can get a thermoplastic splint, that's much nicer for the patient. If not, you can make yourself one with an aluminum and foam splint. And uh, there is a good paper on this by David Quinton, who was one of the consultants with us at the Pulpit of Hand Center. But this is work he did previous to that when he was in Leicester, and he followed him up for two years with excellent results. There are many ways of doing a, an extension splint. You can make them yourself, or you can get somebody who knows how to make splints, make them. And then we start the first week, flex 30 to 40 degrees, and then straighten them about 10 degrees each week for about three weeks and then let them move free. If you have to flex the PIP a lot, like 60 or 70 degrees for it to become congruent, then that, that's not gonna work. It's, it's gonna jump out the first time they contract. But if uh, it's an unstable inflection or, or keeps jumping out, what do you do then? Well, there are some papers that says, well, you can put a wire and transfix the joint. And uh, you can see this one that's in a splint here. So we tried flexing it, but it still got the V sign. So that means that that's not reduced. Uh, 
and this was treated with a with a KY cross the joint. There are a couple of papers from Nottingham, uh, Tim Davis, Tim, the original one with Nicholas Barton as well many years ago, and they they produce good results with this, similar to what they get with internal fixation. So that is an option. Another option is to put a dorsal buttress splint. Mm -hmm. So put a buttress into the head of the proximal phalanx. And if you try to put the KY between the central slip and the lateral band, you may allow a little bit of movement there, a little bit of flexion. And that has got good reports. I mean, our personal results with that are, are not great. So what we do, if they don't reduce with flexion, we'll try traction. So with the same image intensifier, I'll pull it. If pulling it reduces, then keeping that traction at work. And you could do that with some traction splint, with a dynamic or with a static external fixator. And there are many types of external fixators, uh, as, you, as you will have seen. And you can use whichever you want, as long as you are familiar with it. And all they do is they pull the, the two bones apart based on ligament ataxis, the fact that the ligaments are attached to the bones. And one of the most popular ones is the Suzuki technique, like these ones. Some of them are a bit more elaborate, like the ligament ataxa, where you can turn that spring and control your traction. And there is this one, uh, which was published by uh, Greg Giddings, who's with us today. And this is the one that we use, just because it's very simple, once you know how to do it, it's very cheap. And all you need is two K wires, 1.1 K wires. And this uh, sequence I'm gonna show you is actually from Gray himself uh, doing it on a patient and the local anesthetic. Uh, first put the wire on the uh, skin and mark with pen where you're gonna go. And that first wire needs to go through the center of rotation of the PIP joint, which is that the insertion of the collateral ligaments and then once uh, you've put that one across, I'll, I'll remind you, these are 1.1 millimeter K wires and they need to be long. Some, some K wires nowadays are quite short, they will not do. Then the second K wire needs to be parallel to the first and through the middle phalanx. And you check it again with the image intensifier, see where you are. And then you bend the arms of the distal wire to make the arms of the fixator. So that will be the two parallel arms that are gonna keep the two bones away. I'll take you back one step. So you bend them up, then you give them a curve and you give them a curve in the direction and that will push that wire away from the other one. Now you will see in some pictures and in some descriptions, including that, that, that original one, that they use this wire to make the arms. Yeah, but that has a downside. If you use this one to make the arms, the rotation will have between the wire and the bone and you'll get more loosening and you'll get more problems with the skin. If you use those ones, the rotation happens between one wire and the other. So the wires don't move inside the bone. It gives you less, less problems. And um, once you've done that, you can adjust the, the, the tension. You lock them so it doesn't come uh, and disentangle, and that's what the contracts, contract looks like. And we've treated a good collection of patients with this with a generally pretty good results. And I'm very glad to have Gray here. He can put me right and um, give us some more tips for this. But what happens if it doesn't with traction? And sometimes it doesn't because it's got a depressed fragment and that's not attached to any ligaments. So as you pull, ligamentotaxis doesn't bring that fragment. And there are three things you can do. You can accept that, or you can try to uh, reduce it close, percutaneously. And Wolfgang has developed a technique for this that he has used for many years. And I'll ask him to show that because that's very interesting. Or you can open it up. And if you open it up, the way I would do it is a volar approach to the proximal interphalangeal joint. And I think this is important to know exactly how you do it, not to cause more damage. And how we do it is uh, use a Brunner incision on the volar aspect, uh, raise a flap of a pulley. Uh, the bit between the A2 and the A4 can be raised in one piece. Uh, 
that will expose the flexor tendons, then retract FDP towards one side, and you'll be there on the insertion of FDS. So then what I do is, is I split the two slips of FDS, cut the chiasma there, and lift the FDS towards the sides, but to, I don't disinsert them laterally. So I open them like if I'm opening a box, but not pulling the flaps at the top of the box, and then retract one bit of FDS to one side, one bit of FDS at the other side, but without detaching them completely. And that exposes nicely the whole of the volar aspect of the middle phalanx. So once you're there, uh, what you need to do is find the fracture. These patients often come a bit late, at least in my case, and it's difficult to find. You'll have some scar tissue there where the fracture is. And the first thing I'll do is put a green needle to find my fracture, check with the image intensifier, I am where I think I am. And then with a little knife, little beaver blade, clear the scar tissue there. So in a way, recreate the fracture and clean that up. If, if there is a, a depressed fragment of joint like this one here, that's often the case in the ones that go for surgery, then I'll lift that up uh, with a tool, which can be a bent K wire or can be a freeze or Watson chain, lift that up and get it there. And then I've got a hole behind it. And I like putting a bit of bone substitute there. You could put some bone graft, but a bone substitute works well. And I think that that helps it heal quicker. Uh, it gets impacted. And then once you've done that, uh, reduce the fracture. And I prefer to fix it with a little plate. So that's the patient, uh, green needle where the fracture is. So I don't take off the volar plate of the small fragment. I don't devascularize the little fragment. I don't do anything to the collaterals. Just be delicate, get in there through the fracture. Then with a little beaver blade, reopen the plane, raise the little fragment, and then you're there. So that's, that's my approach for this type of fracture. I'll give you an example. This was a 22-year-old uh, high-level basketball player who sustained an injury, hit by the ball in, in a match. And you can see there that there is a fracture, but also that there is a little depressed fragment of joint there. And I'm interested in putting that back and giving him the best joint possible. So that's what we did. Get there through the fracture, push that little fragment down, and then put a little plate uh, to contain it. And that's what it looks like at the end. And then you can mobilize them very quickly and they seem to be reasonably well. So that's, that's the intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy. So needle to find the place, clean the fracture side, then bring back the joint surface, uh, backfill the, the hole that you get and then put a plate. These are 1.2 or 1.3 millimeter plates. They are straight and I don't bend them. I just put them there and compress them. So they're buttressing the fragment, uh, but I don't, don't pre-mold them. And that's, that's what it looks like at the end. And then uh, um, at the end of that, I suture the two slips of FDS to each other. And that basically covers my plate. The FDS will stick down onto the plate, but that's where it's supposed to be inserted anyway. So that's not an issue. And the rate of removing these plates, in my experience, is very low. I mean, people, people are really not bothered. Uh, I'll show you one more. This was a 31-year-old physiotherapist playing cricket on Sunday. Uh, some people uh, may not know about cricket. It's just a crazy game that's played with a solid ball. Uh, they throw it as hard as they can, and uh, a match goes on for days. It's incomprehensible to anybody, really, you know. Um, so I'm just having a go at here, the British guys, you know. So this guy was playing, playing cricket, it was hit by a ball, and this one was not reducing nicely with flexion. And when I tried traction, uh, these two fragments were coming apart. Yeah, so that, that concerned me. So I offered him a fixation that he accepted. And I did it uh, exactly as I've shown, volar approach, a uh, little play there, butter the fragments. And uh, 
the next question is what's the post of management because I think that makes a huge difference actually and maybe the reason my patients do very well is that we've got excellent hand therapists that look after the patient very well uh, because there are two issues they'll come back to clinic and they cannot move the reason they cannot move is is, is double one it's painful and the other one is swollen and if a finger is swollen it's like an inbuilt spleen it hasn't got the tissues uh, long enough to be able to move. This is for, from Paul Brand's book, and it shows you that if you have a couple of millimeters of swelling, uh, you need much more length of the skin that you haven't got to cause that. So if I operate on one of these, for example, Thursday or Friday, which are my usual days, I'll see them in clinic on Monday, and they know they're gonna spend all morning in clinic because you're gonna take the dressings off, I'm gonna do a local anesthetic block if it's painful, then they go for a coffee while the local anesthetic works, they come back and they have some coban, which is a compressive bandage applied to the finger. And that brings the swelling down. But again, you need to give it 20 minutes, half an hour. They go for another coffee, they come back. And by then they have no pain. The swelling is mostly down. You can get them doing exercises and you can get a nearly full range of movement by day three or day four. Once they have seen the movement and they keep moving and they elevate the hand, the swelling mostly stays away and they might need an eye to splint in extension. And so this is our physiotherapist, uh, four weeks down the line. And this guy, I operated on him on the Thursday and he went back to work on the Monday. Uh, not doing his full job, but doing, doing most, most of it. Uh, so I'm going to stop here again, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, Wolfgang and Gray what they think about that. And I would uh, ask Wolfgang first. Wolfgang, would you be able to show us you, you, your technique of the percutaneous reduction? Okay, you have to pin it. Okay, yeah. At first, the instructions for use uh, the sequence of reduction maneuvers. So at first, you see here the dislocation to the dorsal side. And uh, with a big wall of fragment and an impaction zone, maybe on one or also on both sides. At first, you have to put traction on the finger. Then, second, bend the finger for reduction of the dorsal um, uh, subluxation. Then, three, uh, drill a hole in the area between the tractus lateralis in the tendon free area. Put in a 1.0 K wire that spend like a golf club, push back the articular surface, and then force, go in with a K wire, maybe also the rule of flexor tendon and catch the important key fragment, the volar K fragment and fix it against the stable dorsal side. And then you have to decide if it's stable, you can let it like it is, put on a, a traction device or also put it in zero degree for four weeks in a, in a thermoplastic sprint. Only in some cases you need maybe a transfixing wire if that all does not work. If you have a big comminution zone, uh, then maybe you need uh, uh, an accessory transfixing or blocking K wire, but mostly we put traction devices on it. Uh, I show you here a small video uh, of the technique. You see here in local anesthesia, the 1.0 K wire is put it into the uh, inner, inner side and you can turn it around with your needle holder and see how I push back the articular surface. Then I go with one K, fry, K wire through the flexor tendon and uh, pull the volar key fragment against the dorsal and drill from dorsal to volar and fix it. And you see, I put the K wires with my fingers in position because you have more, then you put out the volar key wire. Then in the other plane, you put a 0 0.8 or also 0 0.6 very fine needles over the, uh, over the reduced articular surface. 
So I decide here to put a second one in the other plane in a grid-like fashion over the articular surface. The patient is <laughs> interested in my operation. And you see here now the joint is running correct. And you see uh, uh, here down, you can see here that it is dorsal subluxating and here it's really with this kind of uh, fixation uh, running perfect. Here one case, you see here a 30, 33 old woman with an impaction on one side and a only a slight dorsal subluxation pushing back the articular fragments in a grid-like fashion after six weeks. You see here after 10 weeks, a perfect motion. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you. And we can talk about it. Thank you, that's, that, 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 that's, that's great. Um, great, uh, do you want to make any comments on um, uh, external fixation? Uh, yes, um, well, first of all, I'd say a very nice technique, Wolfgang, uh, that's very skilled. Uh, yeah, my move, my thinking has moved on on this, uh, and I think that the key key is to work out what we're trying to do. And I think we're not trying to get a really good reduction of the base of the middle phalanx. That's I don't think important. It might be helpful, but it's not important. I think the key is: is the joint going to glide, or is it going to pivot? Would you mind if I just shared my screen? If I can do that, uh, do that. Yeah, you should be able to do that. Um, so, is it, is it letting you? Yeah. yeah. So here, if I hope everyone can see this, here this is a typical fracture dislocation, and you can see when they flex, this one is pivoting about that point marked by the arrow. You may be able to see my marker. Yeah. Okay. That one is going to do badly non-operatively. You need to fix it. How you fix it, I'll leave up to you. This sort of injury here smashed up base of middle phalanx, you think that's gonna do badly. But you get this patient to flex and actually that joint is gliding reasonably. It's not a great joint, detached from here and so on, but the joint is gliding. And here's this lady, nasty injury. Here she is at two and a half weeks, still very swollen without surgery and getting already getting a good range of motion. So I now, get these patients to, um, to flex their finger and take a lateral x-ray. It's a bit like extension ones for the mallet. And if they glide, I just get them going. I keep a close eye on them. And normally within three or four weeks, they've got very good range of motion. They do particularly well with the DIP joint, which gets stiff with other things. So I'm very keen on that. In terms of the external fixator, I endorse everything you say. I think it's nice and straightforward under local anesthetic. Uh, we had it the wrong way around initially and that was pointed out by other people. And like you, and this was pointed out to me by Ian Loudon, I'll see them weekly for the first two weeks. And if they're not making good progress, I'll give them an injection of local anesthetic to make them go. I, I'm, a, I'm very, very anti manipulations under anesthetic of people, but I think giving them local anesthetic, encouraging them, I think can be very helpful. So that's my experience. I rarely would open them. The one question I would, I'll pose to you and Wolfgang is for the, not so much for the wiring, but for the open surgery, I would suggest you probably have to operate with intolerances of around one to two millimeters. And whilst I'm very confident you can, Carlos, I'm not sure that most surgeons can, and I'm pretty sure I can't. Well, well, <laughs> I also would warn you <laughs> to open it up from Wollerly because we did it. Our, our, my teacher, it was Jörg Böhler, 30 years ago, he always said, uh, on the principles of AO, it is an intraarticular fracture and you have to reduce it open and, and, and stabilize it. We opened it, then the whole fragments were on the table and uh, <laughs> the mess was perfect. And so at that time, we invented that, that percutaneous method. And since that time, I opened, yeah, some. I had to open up because if the fragments were in the dorsal recess and could not be reduced somehow with 
pushing them back or so, but in 90% of all cases, we do it percutaneously now, yeah. And uh, accessory attraction device on it. And so we get in our hands the best results, but open it up needs a very skilled, skillful surgeon who, who knows what to do. Uh, otherwise it ends up in a mess. Now, I would, I, would, uh, um, I would second all that actually. And that's why I was quite particularly in showing this approach step by step. I mean, you see people operating on this and they'll go in, they'll cut the ball of play from the small fragment, they'll divide the collaterals to have more access. And, uh, and then you, you end up with the moment when you're looking at the fraction and you say, well, whose idea was it to open this up, you know? Um, We've all, we've all had some of those moments. Now, I, and there are lots of questions, guys, and, and I know that, I'm aware, but I'm keen to um, go into our third bit, which is uh, to do with uh, salvage, which is when things have gone wrong, and then we'll address as many of the questions as we can. Uh, so let me go back to where we were. And you have a collection of patients that come late, and they are, they are big challenges, these ones, because they often come to you because they think you're gonna give them a normal joint, uh, maybe six months after an injury that was missed. Um, and there is a list of options, including volaplate arthroplasty, hemihamate, osteotomies, PIP denervation, arthrodisy, joint replacements, joint transfers, or do nothing. Uh, and this one is uh, the one that, um, Wolfgang made me think before, is an injury where you see a very small volar fragment. Then you say, well, that's just a little, a little injury. But if, when you look at there, you see that there's a bit of, frag of joint that's sunk in. And you see that side to side is not sitting central. Yeah, so it's subluxated laterally. So this is one of those that's a bit of a trick. And um, this was treated with, um, in our unit with, with, with a little X fix, like the one I've shown you to try and improve that. Uh, and initially uh, looked good, then it looked uh, less good. And then the lady came back with a joint that uh, on X-ray doesn't look too good. So when you look at the radiograph, you think, uh, what am I gonna do here? However, uh, the lady uh, has practically no pain. So the finger doesn't look very good, it's a bit angulated, and it is reasonable to do nothing, or at least offer that as an option to patients. So always remember that you don't have to treat it because the x-ray looks terrible. And some of them don't get pain, I just don't know why. Uh, the other option is to do hemihamid reconstruction. This is based on the observation that at the carpometacarpal joint of the fourth and fifth metacarpals, uh, you will have a piece of hamate that resembles the geometry of the PIPJ. So you can take a graft of bone with cartilage and use it to reconstruct this, this bit here and reconstruct this volabatris, that, that's very important, yeah? So it does, cannot be flat, it needs to, needs to protrude a little bit that way. And this was originally presented by Hill Hastings in 1999 at the American Society. Hill Hastings is a, is a great uh, surgeon from the Indiana Hand Center in Indianapolis. And he presented that. So that is one option. And I think it's a reasonable option for reconstruction. Some people use it for primary fractures, but I think it's a bit of an overkill for primary fractures. Uh, the next option is to do an intraarticular osteotomy. So they come to you with uh, interarticular malunion and some subluxation. And uh, one of the people who have pushed this is Paco del Pinal, who was with us last week talking about thumb reconstructions. And this is, this is his work, basically. And he presented that years ago, and he published it in 2007. Uh, and that's one of his cases, 31 year old musician that was sent to him nine weeks down the line with a large depressed fragment. I think this is a bit too late to try to um, reduce um, close or percutaneously. You're gonna have to do something there. It's a splayed, uh, you get the V sign dorsally. Uh, it just doesn't look good. And what uh, the um, view here is, is you do a volar approach, not the one I've shown you, the one you do to double barrel it, and then open the joint 
and you see here the, the, the mild union, the gap and the depression, uh, and you can redo this cat and that cat, clean all that, put the bits together with the circular wire that goes around, you can compress that and then if necessary, just add, add one screw. And that's uh, this case. And this is uh, the patient is the little finger we are looking. Uh, that was the uh, scar from the approach on the volar side. And this is, this is the function and this is uh, down the line. So you can get, you can salvage some of the joints by doing that. Uh, it's not easy, but it is doable. Uh, another option is a volaplate arthroplasty. I'm not gonna uh, spend much time on this, but this is an option uh, worth considering actually. And you remember how I mentioned that the, the, the surface of, particular surface of the middle phalanx continues into the volaplate like one piece. So the idea here is that if you've lost some of the joint surface here, you can advance the volar plate and put it in there. And there are several ways of doing that. And that can get you out of trouble for some patients. Volar plate arthroplasty, bear that in mind. Uh, and I'll show you two uh, disasters and how they were finally managed. Uh, this one was a 42 year old lady uh, who's an artist and a horse rider. So she works as a glass engraver. So she does this and she uses her right little finger to pivot the motor to do the engravings. So that was a fracture of the right little finger to do with writing. And uh, originally it was treated uh, conservatively, but ended up uh, being still subluxated, being very painful, very stiff, and she couldn't do her work. She, she is self-employed. So when she was not working, she was not earning. So that was uh, very stressful and uh, she wanted something doing. And it was considered at the time that the one way to return the joint would be doing a joint replacement. And she had this joint replacement. I think this is a very, very high stake choice because um, joint replacements, uh, if they work, they work well, but they tend not to increase the pre op movement. And also in a finger that is small with the small bones is very difficult to get it in. So that soon got loose. And then they thought, well, what can be done now? And it was replaced, it was revised to a silicone one. And you can just see the silicone one that looks like uh, one of these, that the stem here is in the bone, but the stem in the distal part is outside the bone because the bone is so little and there is a lot of bone missing there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, she came to see me like this uh, and I discussed all the options. Um, I tried with a splint to see if an arthrodesis would help her. She said, I cannot work with an arthrodesis. I need to be able to bend that finger. Uh, we tried excluding that finger, she couldn't work. So she said, we need to do something about it because this finger is my livelihood. So what we did is take some measurements uh, go to the toes, see which joint was better, and do a free vascularized PIP joint transfer, which is a big operation, but it does give them a PIP joint that works. And that fortunately healed nicely. And uh, she could regain full flexion and very good extension. And she was, she was very happy with that, went back to work. And I'll just show you one more. This was a 14 year old, a very promising rugby player. And this little guy uh, sustained a mallet finger. We treated him with a splint and he disappeared, uh, fine. Then he comes back six months later with another injury, which is that one. And as you can see, he has got a volar fracture subluxation. That's probably the central slip and the physis is, is a big, is a big fragmented. So this was taken for manipulation and reduction and splintage. And this is the post-operative post-manipulation. And you can see that it's not reduced and the physis is still down here. So somebody else more senior said, this is not right. We need to reduce it nicely and we need to stabilize it. And I'm gonna put some K wires in it. So he was taken to theater again. He was manipulated. 
the alignment looks better, but the whole of the physis, the epiphysis is there in pieces. Yeah. So this is at the stage I saw this patient with both parents had many questions. The kid only had one question, when he's going to go back to play rugby and how are we going to get a normal joint out of this? And this is the kind of challenge you get presented when things go wrong. Uh, so what I did is open it up, dorsally took all the little uh, fragments of the physis, like a little puzzle, and put them together and glue them with fibrin glue, and then glue that to the bone. And that's what it looked like. Uh, you can get all the bits, you like puzzles, it's quite entertaining. And that was the post-op radiograph. And I also put a K wire to treat the mallet that had not healed completely. And I followed it up. This is a year later. And the joint remodeled nicely. It was very congruent. And these are some pictures that he sent me. Is the right middle finger we're looking at. And uh, this is his movement. And this is his movement here. So he did very well because he was young and we got a bit lucky. So bear in mind that these joints are salvageable even when they look terrible. So the questions I ask myself with the dorsal one is does it reduce inflection? If it does, put the spleen, does it reduce with traction? If it does, some X fix or the traction of spleen can help. Doesn't it internal fixation? They're a minority or do we go for? for salvage. So we've spoken about all these treatment, splints, K wires across the joint or buttress, external fixators, percutaneous reduction and K wires as well and show, open reduction, internal fixation and salvage surgery. When you look at the evidence for that, there are several reviews and systematic reviews and the uh, conclusion seems to be this, no treatment method of, or fracture type yielded consistently better outcomes than another. It's because it's only mainly based on a small retrospective studies and because there is a variety of, of fractures and treatments. So how do I think about that? Is the dislocation, the, the injury palmar or dorsal palmar, is it reducible and stable in extension? If it is, they get the splint. If not, if it's in, unreducible or reducible or very unstable, I may, I may open it up and, and fix it, which is a minority. If there's a dorsal injury, the first question is, does it reduce inflection? And I mean, does it become congruent at 30 to 40 degrees of flexion? If the answer is yes, they'll get the splint. Very rarely, they need the KY in my experience. If it's no, does it reduce with traction? If it reduces with traction, the answer is yes, then an external fixator or a traction splint can help. Uh, if that doesn't happen, uh, then is internal fixation possible? Or you could use uh, the technique of percutaneous reduction and KYs. And I'll fix a minority of these of these ones. If internal fixation or the fraction are possible because it's too late or too comminuted or because of previous treatment, then you talk about salvage surgery and we've seen the list of them. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Wolfgang, uh, any tips on salvaging these difficult problems, particularly the ones that come late? Well, <clears throat> congratulations to your cases, which went very well. Uh, but not all of those, these cases are so easy. Uh, I prefer in, in most cases uh, where all went, all went wrong, uh, distraction distraction with strong springs for six weeks and uh, with the physiotherapy I get uh, yeah in many cases a good motion even when the joint surface is not perfect that's mostly my solution in some cases the the hemet procedure but mostly I put them under traction and the control traction for six weeks. Okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, Gray, any, any tips on the salvage ones? Yes, two, a number of things. I mean, first of all, I think that, I think it's a difference between salvage at six to eight weeks and salvage at 
three to four months and beyond. At six to eight weeks, you might be able to rescue it, though it's hazardous surgery. I think by three to four months, it is truly salvage. I think that these, I encourage the patients to wait. I might give them a steroid injection. And some of them do surprisingly well. Often they don't have a lot of pain. And even if they're a bit stiff, my experience, and I think the literature, what little there is suggests that by about two years, they don't deteriorate. So it's not like they've got an arthritic joint, it'll be shot in 10 years. We don't see these people 10 years down the line who come with terrible, painful joints. The odd one, but mostly not. So I think there's a lot of merit in waiting. Um, I did volerate plate arthroplasties when I first started because I was trained with them. I think they don't work well in the Anglo-Saxon hand. There was an interesting presentation at the joint meeting of the British and Indian hand societies in um, February, and they, the, our Indian colleagues were reporting good results with volar plate arthroplasties. And I just wonder if it's because their soft, the, the Indian soft tissues are more lax. You see Indian hands and they're, they're more lax and I think they do better. So I think the volar plate doesn't work well. I think if there's a big loss volarly, I think the heavy hamate is a good procedure. But I think again, you're, this is, you're working at tolerances of one to two millimeters. I think it's not, not an operation for an occasional solo operator. And I like Wolfgang's idea. Um, I've tried it once or twice in the past, but without great success, probably not been as assiduous as his. And I think that that's a really nice idea because what you're doing is restoring some gliding. And if you restore gliding, hand joints do well. Good, that's good. Uh, now I'll put a few of the questions to you. I'll answer the first one. Somebody says, it's a slightly leading question, I think, said, would you agree that your outcomes depend to a very large extent on the excellence of your therapists? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, the, the, what the therapists do is, is absolutely essential because if a protocol is not followed, it's going to be a disaster. So, so yes, how often do you see them in clinic? I think these, these ones, particularly the acute ones, you need to see them weekly for the first about four weeks. After that, uh, alea jacta est, as they said in Latin, the, the, the luck is made, you're not going to change that. You know, there's no point in seeing them in six weeks. You know, six weeks is decided if the joint is going to work well or not, because it depends on what you do between now and then. Um, Wolfgang and Gray, there is a question about, is it reasonable to treat fracture dislocations with just a transarticular K wire for four weeks? Is that a decent thing to do? Well, I would not transfix his joints. I would put a distraction uh, device on it. I don't like transfixing his joints. Because of a stiffness? Well, I think life is motion. And if you put a distraction fixator with moving, you get a remodeling of the articular surface. And that's very important. And uh, you don't get remodeling with transfixation. You have to begin if you put out a wire from, from the beginning. Yeah, I, I will show you one case that you, that you see what motion can bring. Look at that. That was a really comminuted fracture. What would you do is the question. Gray, what, what would you do? Uh, well, I, I'd take a lateral flexion x-ray. And if it glided, then I'd plan to treat it non-operatively. I think with that degree of dorsal tilt, I'd probably immobilize in a splint for a couple of weeks, but you risk losing that. But I would be very tempted just to get it going. I'd really want to see what it looked like on the lateral x-rays. And as Carlos said, I'd keep a very close eye. I mean, I'm flexible. And if after a week or two, we're not winning, I might change tack. So you see, it was 1988. We put it on a finger splint. And then I sent it to my physiotherapist and she was under direction, constantly moving the finger. And he got a remodeling of the dorsal dislocated articular surface. You see here a breaching, this is like a remodeling. And now see, no, 
I have no, no flexion. He had perfect motion, perfect flexion, perfect extension. I'm missing the, the, the last slide here. Uh, so you can say motion is all. For me, it's motion all. If you do it with a physiotherapist, if you do it with a traction splint, that's my opinion for this kind of really destroyed articular surfaces. 